In this video, we continue looking at reactions of epoxides. And we follow that theme that we've been developing so far that the main type of reaction that epoxides undergo is that of ring opening. In this video, we focus on the ring opening of epoxides when they react with Grignard reagents. Now, to start, we need perhaps a reminder about what we're referring to specifically when we talk about a Grignard reagent. Grignard reagents are a specific type of organometallic compound where the carbon is directly bonded to magnesium and that magnesium is bonded to a halogen. So X is a halogen, C is a carbon, and this carbon is very versatile. It can be an SP, SP2, or SP3 carbon. It doesn't matter. So you can have an aromatic ring directly bonded to magnesium in this Grignard reagent or a variety of other possibilities as well. The way the Grignard reagents are created is simply by reacting the corresponding halogenated compound, where X is a halogen, with magnesium. And what happens is that that magnesium will form a direct bond to the carbon, and the chlorine will be out here as a counter ion. And again, the exact nature of the R group here is really versatile. The carbon that's bonded to the halogen atom can be an sp, sp2, or sp3 carbon, and this reaction will work really well to create a Grignard reagent. So why do we care about creating a bond between carbon and magnesium? Well, the inventor of this reaction, Grignard, hence the name Grignard reagent, discovered that when we create a bond between carbon and magnesium, the carbon is very nucleophilic due to the fact that magnesium is more electronegative than carbon. Hence, that carbon-magnesium bond is very polarized so that unlike a typical scenario where carbon is positively polarized and what it's bonded to is negatively polarized, instead, here, the magnesium is positively polarized because the magnesium is less electronegative of the two atoms. Carbon is more electronegative, and so it's very negative polarized. And we can actually think of this in terms of the synthetic usefulness of a Grignard reagent as behaving as if rather than having a covalent bond connecting the carbon and magnesium, like I'm highlighting in blue here, that the way it behaves is as if the electrons in that bond reside entirely on the carbon because the bond is so highly polarized. So it behaves like an ionic substance in many ways in terms of how we think about it reacting. So the Grignard reagent take home message is that it is a source of nucleophilic carbon. So the Grignard reagent is a nucleophilic carbon source. And that is useful because when we have a nucleophilic carbon source, we can use that nucleophilic carbon to attack electrophilic carbons to create new carbon-carbon bonds. So this nucleophilic carbon source is going to enable the creation of new carbon-carbon bonds via the attack of a Grignard reagent on an electrophilic carbon atom. So there are a variety of different scenarios where Grignard reagents can be really effective at creating new carbon-carbon bonds. This is not the last time we will see Grignard reagents in the Organic 2 class. You first saw these back in Organic Chemistry 1, and now we're following up on that. And we'll be using these in a variety of contexts this semester where we will make a Grignard reagent, we'll react that Grignard reagent with an electrophilic carbon to make a new carbon-carbon bond. There aren't that many tools in our toolkit of ways to make carbon-carbon bonds, but carbon-carbon bonds are very, very useful to take simple starting materials and create really complex, commercially useful products. And so the Grignard reagent and Grignard reaction is a very useful one to have near and dear in your mind when you are thinking about solving problems related to the synthesis of complicated organic molecules. So let's go ahead then and apply this general information about Grignard reagents toward the specific scenario of reacting Grignard reagents with epoxides. Thus far, we have talked about reactions that involve ring opening of epoxides under acidic conditions and under basic conditions. 
you should know that Grignard reagents are basic and therefore they are going to follow the rules for reacting basic nucleophiles with epoxide. So Grignard reagents are very strongly basic. And so we're gonna follow the guidelines that we learned in the last video about reacting basic, reacting nucleophiles with epoxides under basic conditions. Um, this is going to be the case because the Grignard reagent can act as a proton acceptor, meaning it's a base, in addition to acting as a source of electrons to bond to a, pro bond to a carbon, which makes the Grignard act as a nucleophile by definition. So let's take a look at an example here of a situation where we could have a Grignard reagent reacting with our epoxide. So I'm gonna go ahead and make my Grignard reagent here. Phenyl magnesium bromide. I'm going to go ahead and react with our epoxide here. We're gonna walk through the mechanism for this reaction as well as predict the final organic product. And the way that this reaction would be carried out is generally first, the reaction will be carried out in an aprotic solvent, such as tetrahydrofuran. The ether is non-reactive with the phenyl magnesium bromide or any other Grignard reagent. And then secondly, after that reaction had taken place, we would add dilute acid. The Grignard reagent is so basic that we can't have any source of proton present in conjunction with the Grignard reagent. Otherwise, the Grignard reagent would very quickly react with that particular solvent and um, no longer be effective as a nucleophile. So that's why we have to add the acid second, is if we had even a weak acid like water present or an alcohol present, the Grignard reagent would very quickly react with that rather than be carrying out its intended purpose of acting as a nucleophile. So what's going to happen here in this reaction mechanism is that the nucleophilic carbon of the Grignard reagent is going to attack the less sterically hindered of the two carbons of the epoxide. So this step of the mechanism is very analogous to what we were looking at when we were talking about basic nucleophiles reacting with epoxides in that the first step of the mechanism was the basic nucleophile attacking the less directly hindered carbon of the epoxide. So in the case of our reactant, we can write this out by thinking of the carbon magnesium bond here that I'm highlighting in red as being so, so polarized with the magnesium being the less electronegative atom, meaning it's positively polarized, carbon being more electronegative, meaning it's negatively polarized, that that bond we can really treat like an ionic bond where for our intents and purposes, the electrons are on the carbon atom. So that's going to be enabling it to act as our nucleophile. So that's how I've drawn it out here to highlight the way that it's going to be reacting with our epoxide. It is going to attack the epoxide in the easiest to access site, which is going to be this less sterically hindered carbon of the two carbons of the epoxide. The one on the left here is less sterically hindered than the one on the right. So that's where the attack takes place. And then that's going to force the breakage of the carbon oxygen bond right here. The electrons go into the oxygen like so. And so that's going to lead us to our intermediate here. We'll have an oxygen anion. It's an oxygen anion because we broke this carbon oxygen bond here. The electrons in that bond went onto the oxygen to make an oxygen anion. And then the carbon of the epoxide from that side is bonded to two methyl groups. So I plug in the two methyl groups. That was the methyl group here and here, go here and here. This, our carbon from the epoxide comes over to the other carbon from the epoxide. And that other carbon from the epoxide, that is the one that was right here, is now connected to the phenyl group. P-H-E-N-Y-L is how we refer to uh, aromatic ring. So go ahead and plug that in like so. And that's directly bonded to the CH2 group here, so therefore we have a complete octet of this carbon. And all that we're missing is we need a proton for this oxygen. And so what will happen is the reaction will sit around like so until the acid is added because we put the step two was adding acid. So step two, 
after the acid is added, what's going to happen is protonation of the oxygen. So the oxygen anion is going to pick up a proton. And so I will go ahead and draw that out here. I'm abbreviating the aromatic ring as a pH group. That's the standard abbreviation for an aromatic ring. And now I'm going to plug in my branches there at the end, the methyl branch. And we will go ahead with bringing in the acid, which I'm just going to abbreviate as H plus for simplicity's sake here. And we'll take our lone pair electrons from the base, oxygen, bring those in and grab a proton from the, pro from the acid. And that's going to give us our aromatic ring, which I abbreviate again as pH for phenol. And we will have our hydroxy group there. So our final product of this reaction sequence is going to be what I've circled here in blue. There are no stereocenters in this product, so we don't need to worry about drawing wedges or dashes. If there were stereocenter or stereocenters, we would need to be mindful about drawing in wedges and dashes and showing the inversion of configuration. There is that inversion of configuration if we're carrying out this reaction at a stereocenter due to the fact that this is behaving like an SN2 reaction where it's in this first phase of the reaction where the SN2 is going on because the hallmark of SN2 is that the nucleophile attacks at the same time the leaving group leaves and that's exactly what we're seeing here and what I've circled with the laser pointer. So the nucleophilic carbon is attacking as the leaving group breaks away. So that makes this SN2 and hence there would be inversion of configuration if this was at a stereocenter. So like the Grignard reagents where you have a carbon directly bonded to a magnesium, organolithium reagents will react similarly in attacking epoxide rings, enabling epoxide rings to open and generating the creation of a new carbon-carbon bond. So when we talk about an organolithium compound, we're referring to a situation where we have a carbon directly bonded to lithium. And when you have an organolithium reagent, we can handle that and react that analogously to the Grignard reagents in our, in our reactions with epoxide. So let's take a look at an example problem of that. So here we're going to predict the major organic product. And we'll go ahead and do the mechanism as well for the following reaction. So for the reaction that I've drawn out here, we are going to treat the organolithium, specifically propyl lithium here, analogously to how we responded with the Grignard reagent in the last example problem. Namely, what will happen is that in the first step, the nucleophilic carbon of the organolithium is going to attack the less sterically hindered of the two carbon atoms of the epoxide. So we'll go ahead and bring in our organolithium and we can represent that as a three carbon chain if we like here, CH3, CH2, CH2. And much like with the Grignard reagent where we thought of this bond between carbon and metal as being a bond that's so polarized that we can think of the carbon as carrying the electrons from that bond and acting as a carb anion, we can do the same thing here. And so therefore that's why I put in a three carbon chain and I have this carbon at the end of that chain, the carbon that's bonded to the lithium, acting as a carb anion. And what it's going to do in acting as a carb anion is it will act as both a strong base and a very capable nucleophile coming in and attacking the less sterically hindered of the two carbon atoms of the epoxide. So it's gonna attack here and that's going to force the carbon-oxygen bond to break right here, sending the electrons from that bond up onto the oxygen. So we'll go ahead and draw out the product of this step here, where we'll have a six-membered ring. We'll have our methyl group still as a dash. Our bond to the oxygen will be a wedge because at this position, our carbon-oxygen bond that I'm highlighting We've done nothing to that position to alter the configuration of it, and so that's why I'm showing it as a wedge down here as well. It will have three sets of lone pair electrons present on the oxygen. 
That's going to give it a negative formal charge. And then the propyl group that has come in will come in and attack from the side opposite where the leaving group is leaving because that is the easier path for attack. So since the leaving group left as a wedge, that means that the propyl group needs to appear as a dash. And so I'm going to show the propyl group here as a dash with my three carbon chain there. Now at this point, what we will do is wait around until the acid is added. Once the acid is added, we'll have a source of proton there in the reaction mixture. And that will enable the lone pair electrons from the oxygen to come over, pick up that proton, and lead us to our final organic product of this reaction. Where we'll have our hydroxy group there, and then at the other position, our three carbon chain, giving us our final product of this stereoselective and regioselective reaction. It's stereoselective because we have a preference for the inversion of configurations. We're inverting the stereochemistry at this stereocenter, and the reaction is regioselective because of the fact that the nucleophile prefers to attack the less hindered of the two carbons, giving us a specific preference for this constitutional isomer rather than a constitutional isomer where the propyl group came in and formed a bond at the other carbon of the epoxide group. So with that, we conclude our sequence of videos where we focus on ring opening reactions of epoxides. You should now be familiar with the mechanism and predicting products for reacting epoxides with nucleophiles under acidic conditions, as well as under basic conditions, such as the organolithium and Grignard reagent conditions we just have been speaking about here in this video.